Well, N- Nell did make it back, and uh, or made it here, and she uh, told me last night that she was afraid to come in one sense because if she moves just right, the pain is so sharp that she'll just holler out. And I said, we'll just holler out amen. <laughs> but, but that kind of reminds me of a story, and I'm, I'm off the subject a long ways. So I don't know if I'll ever get back to the subject, but when I first started at Lubbock Christian, I was... Uh, the credibility of the school was pretty low, and so I decided that one of the things I had to do was to get out and speak to groups everywhere. And so I would do Friday, Saturday, and Sunday things with churches. I'd do things with businesses. I'd do sometimes Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday night things with churches. And so one of the, one of the first ones I went to was in Clarendon, Texas. Uh, you know, maybe it's just off the interstate as you go out toward Amarillo and... Uh, they have a little, little tiny junior college. I think it's the smallest junior college in Texas. is in Clarendon. And I, I was going up there one, uh, I guess it was early one Sunday morning. Yeah, it was, I was going to be a Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And I always go early because I didn't know where the building was. I got there early. And so when I got there, standing out on the porch were three men. One was an elder of that congregation. I've been there many times, but... Uh, not in a lot of years. I, you know, you wear out your welcome after a little while. Yeah. And, uh, but the two, the two fellows standing with this elder were very short in stature. One was named John, and the other was named Glenn. And uh, Glenn had a chemical deficiency when he was in his mother's womb, and when he was born, they didn't check for this, and they didn't give him the proper injections, and so he never matured physically or mentally. Uh, my understanding is now that's all checked out and things are taken care of, so it wouldn't happen in modern day times for Glenn to end up like that. John had the condition of Down syndrome. And so when I went up and I introduced myself to them, I, I, John was talking so rapidly I could not understand him. He had a great big Bible tucked under his arm, like one of these, remember the old family Bibles you used to have on a coffee table? And the elder spoke to me, who's still uh, an acquaintance of mine, a friend of mine, and he said, uh, Ken, what he's trying to tell you is he wants to be a preacher. So I didn't think much about that. Went into the building that morning. I was standing back at the back. I always go in when I'm someplace new and kind of check things out and see where everything's located. And I noticed that up behind the pulpit, John was walking back and forth doing this, just back and forth. And he was playing the role of a preacher, and I guess that's what their preacher did. He must wave his arms like that all the time, because John was playing the role of a preacher. And uh, the, the two parts I remember to this story. One is, that, that morning I was speaking, and, and I was just rocking along with a thought, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came this loud amen. And I, it was John. John. John just yelled out an amen out of nowhere, and I... It was so shocking to me, I lost my complete train of thought. I, could, I couldn't even, I could, I, what was I? <laughs> but I tried to be nice, so that night I drove back to Lubbock. It's about a, almost a three-hour drive from Clarendon, going back through the back roads, the canyons, and, and getting back to Lubbock. And I told Suze and both of our children were home then, and I told them, and I said, uh, he's carrying a great big old King James Version coffee table Bible, and so... We had, a, had one over in the bookcase that had never been used, a modern speech version. I said, I'm going to take this to John. Monday night, I'll take this to John. Well, I took it to John, and John was so thrilled. He, he just kept coming up to me and saying, shaking it in my face, said, thank you, buddy. Thank you, buddy. And that was in the early days, so I did do that one through Wednesday night. And, and uh, Wednesday night, I was trying to get away, and people were talking to me, and there's, there's a little lady came up to me. And she, she looked over at me, she, she looked over at John and Glenn, and she said, uh, I want to thank you for giving John the Bible. Glenn didn't belong to her, John belonged to her. And she said, uh, one thing I'll never forget. She said, you know, they are human too. That's the word of a mother. But she said, they are human too. They are important too. They are special too. I'm saying all that because this morning when we ended and Susan and I got home, she was talking about Donnie's prayer. 
And, and she said, it just seemed like Donnie was just open and talking about life as though it was just a family here and just talking about his life. And just kind of makes me realize how important every single person is who is here. I mean, everybody's important. I, I believe that with all my mind. But every single person is really, really important. And so if, if you don't feel like coming, we understand that. If you feel like coming, we understand that. If you have some problem, we understand that. It's, it's just, just a family. Donnie told me when he's leaving, he said, I, you know, I can't come back tonight for that party. And I said, I understand that, Donnie. And I, and I said, I'm sure you can't come back at 1 o'clock. Don't worry about it. We all understand. So Donnie's not here today, too. So anyway, way off the subject. But when Nell thought she might holler, i have been through that before. <laughs> and, uh, but it was from John, and I forgot everything I was supposed to say after John did that to me. So, so. And so with all that, I'll make a little comment from uh, the book of, of uh, Hebrews. And we're in chapter 7, and we spent Sunday afternoon last talking about Melchizedek. Everybody remember that? And, uh, and the reason why we're talking about Melchizedek is now spoken of and told to us, beginning in, in verse, uh, let's just start in verse 12, because we cover verse 11. Uh, Jesus came in the order, that's what he's been saying, in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was without beginning, without end, we don't know his genealogy. And, and that's very different from what the priesthood was like from the Judaistic standpoint because the priesthood was all set up under the days of Moses and what tribe was the priesthood from? The tribe of Levi. But he says, when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe. And no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from what tribe? From Judah. Uh, in regard to that tribe, Moses had nothing to say about priest. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, now, you catch that? The priest had to be priest based upon the law, the regulation, based on their ancestry. So if I'm from the tribe of Judah, I've got a shot at this thing of performing a priest. If I'm from the tribe of Levi, I mean, not the tribe of Judah. But, but, but Jesus is different. He's like Melchizedek, he's going to say. For it is declared in verse 17, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. Now while all of this seems to us not to mean a lot, not to have direct bearing to how we live our lives right now, there are some nuggets in here that are pretty important. That law that was held so strongly to and praised so much and traditions built around for centuries upon top of centuries is described here as what? Useless. Useless. It made nothing what? Perfect. Now, we'll find in other places that it wasn't that the law was imperfect. For if we could keep the law perfectly, we would have been perfect. So wherein lies the problem? It's us. It's us. So did you catch this morning when I tried to emphasize, which I've never emphasized in a lesson before like that, but I tried to emphasize this lesson, isn't it interesting that Adam had how many laws? One. He just had one. And he couldn't keep what? He couldn't keep one. How many regulations were written in that law that was given through and by Moses? 
600 and something total. There were just law after law after law. It, there were laws about what I would eat and, and what I would not eat and what I would touch and what I would not touch and what I would do on one day versus another day. It, it just every kind of regulation you can imagine. But it, it was useless. It could not bring perfection because if I can't keep one, what am I, what am I going to do with 600? Uh, and several of you are teachers or former teachers in this group. And is every school fraught with rules? Does every school have rules? I mean, the little school that our granddaughter goes to in Lubbock right now is called Kingdom Preparatory Academy, and it's a college preparatory school, even in the sixth grade. They wear uniforms. I mean, they, they have, there are all kinds of things that are, that are rules. Uh, does a student ever break a rule at school? In my day, they did. I don't know about today. But in my, in my day, they broke rules fairly often. And, you know, it, it actually started young with me. I can remember a lady named Mrs. Bocamp in as early as the sixth grade, calling me to the front of the classroom and taking a ruler and holding out my hand and slapping my hands. Though I was an angel in the first grade and remained to be right now, she would slap my hands with a ruler. And I have more stories than that, but I'm going to stop with that one, okay? So we're not, we're not good at keeping rules. And so this law was imperfect. And in fact, the law really was useless and a better hope by which we draw near to God was introduced. A better hope by which we draw near to God. Uh, and it was not without an oath. Here we come again with this oath thing. It's been, it's been through the last two chapters that, 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 there's, there's, that God made an oath. And his oath, it says, was... The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So the writer of this book is making an argument that Jesus is ushering in or has brought in a better what? A better covenant, a better promise, a, a, a better organization, whatever you want to call this, it's a better thing that Jesus has brought because the old one wouldn't work. The old one would not work. In fact, in the book of Galatians, the old one is called a what? A school master to teach us what was we need. Now, there have been many of those priests now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in the office. So, one person would be a priest. What would happen to him? He died. So, somebody else would be a priest. In fact, we know that in the days of Zechariah, when John the Baptist was going to be born, going to be announced to God, that he was able, at that particular time, to perform priestly duties. And it was estimated in Jerusalem at that time there were probably 20,000 of these people who could perform those priestly duties. The chances of him getting to do it once in a lifetime, though he was a priest, was really, really, really rare. It just happened to be his day that he got to go. And that's when God makes the announcement to him, by way of the angel, you're going to have a son. Though he and his wife Elizabeth had no children. But Zechariah came and he what? He died. But because Jesus lives forever, he is a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save, now listen to this very carefully, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Now, we say it all the time because there's a statement, the only way to God the Father is through whom? It's through Christ. Is there another way? There's no other way. There are a lot of people who would like to think that there is another way, 
and there are a lot of people who try to promote the idea that there is another way. But if you're going to proclaim God the Creator, Christ the Son, you're going to have to understand that this only God is accessed through only one avenue, and that is through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. That's why we try to mention Jesus in almost everything that we do and every assembly that we have. Because we know there is no way we can be made perfect except by whom? By Him. There's no way I can have access to God except by Him. And so when I tell, uh, speak to us about invoking the name of Jesus when we approach God in prayer, not, by that I don't mean just making sure we close our prayer and say, in Jesus' name. I, I, I almost think that's, uh, that's making light of it. I don't, that's not the right way to put it, but I almost think it's taking it out of context. When we go to God, we are invoking the name of His Son because His Son is the only way we have access to even talk to Him. It's, it's all tied up in, in Jesus. And so He says, it's the only way to God, and in fact, on top of that, the priest was supposed to go inside, especially that most holy place, the high priest, and he was to intercede for God on behalf of the people, Jesus is always what? He's always interceding for us. He's always speaking on our behalf. That is exactly what Romans teaches in, in Romans the 8th chapter when it says that the Spirit is speaking for us and Jesus is always speaking for us. And so it's as though God is on the throne and they're all watching the things that are going on in our lives, and it's, it's Jesus who speaks to the Father and says, Gary's in trouble. Gary needs our help. Look at what's happening to Gary. And the Spirit is speaking to God on our behalf. That's the kind of priesthood that we are a part of right now. That's the kind of organization we're a part of. Now, would you rather have that? Or would you rather have this deal where a, where a guy goes in once a year and their sacrifice is offered several times a year, but a guy goes into the holy place or the most holy place once a year, but he didn't know Gary's name. He didn't know Ken's name. He didn't know Jack's name. He didn't know Ronnie's name. He, he, he didn't know Janet's name. But this priest, who is the priest forever, speaks to God on our behalf. And his knowledge and his ability is unlimited. So which would you rather have? That's what the writer of the book of Hebrews is really asking. Which would you rather have? Such a high priest meets our need. One who is, listen to this about Jesus. One who is holy. Do you remember that from this morning? God is what? Now listen how he describes this. One who is holy blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Did we almost describe it like that this morning? Though I had not thought about this right here when I was doing that. To be holy means to be what? Set apart. Means to be pure. Means to be blameless. Set apart especially from what? Sin. And so we all grew up on, the, on the, the Old Testament phrase that what separates us from God? Sin. Sin separates us from God. Is that accurate? That's totally accurate. Because God is what? Because God is holy. He's perfect. He's pure. He cannot have anything to do with sin. And yet here comes Jesus to give us an opportunity to draw near to God being who we are. Uh, and that's sinful people. That's people who don't deserve. So, the, so Paul will say in the book of Romans, while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us while we were sinners. And he has become also our high priest. He intercedes for us. Uh, 
Unlike the, other priest, uh, unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Just He did it all at one time. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law, the oath from God which came out, appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. So, if you're thinking about leaving Christianity, and you're thinking about leaving your life in Christ, and you're thinking about going back to whatever you had before, If what you had before was this old law that was imperfect, and this priest who didn't know your name, and these regulations, would you really want to go back to that? Would that make any sense whatsoever? So if you're you're headed out the door and someone tells you this, are you going to stop and rethink it? Uh, the, The writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, We need to stay with it. We don't need to give up. Uh, I sent an article today to the two Gregs. They may not have seen it yet, but I sent an article to them via text about church attendance and how church attendance is an all-time low and how it's dropped another 20% since the year 2000 or since 1999. Uh, The interesting thing was that it's, it's not... It's not saying that people are giving up on God. It's saying that there's a new phenomenon in our culture that's partly responsible for this called isolationism. That especially young people don't hang around other young people like they used to. You know why that is? You know what's promoting that and driving that? Anybody have a phone? That's right, Gary. Anybody have a phone? Sometimes I'd rather text you than to look at you and talk to you. <laughs> you, know, you know, that, that's, and so it, it's driving people away. Uh, that's, that's, I'm like, again, all kind of off the subject, but that's why I keep saying, like I did at the beginning of this, how important it is that we are a body that's not pretentious, not, not, not fancy, not sterile, but they were warm and that were open and that were real and that were genuine so that people can feel comfortable. Uh, we, we had a couple here this morning. I didn't know who they were. Ronnie knew who they were. Uh, but so far as I know, the lady has never been in a Church of Christ before. Uh, his grandparents used to come here all the time, and I was I was interested that they came. I was interested in their comments, uh, but hopefully, what they saw was something that was not pretentious, that was not as people might say fake, but something that was real, open, genuine. That's what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying that Jesus brought to us. He didn't bring a bunch of hierarchy. Uh, He didn't bring a bunch of... He bought a direct connection between God and us through him. And it's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty good deal. In fact, it's the best deal going. And we don't want to give up on it. It's also strange that uh, the complexity of the Jewish law... Oh, I got this is this offering, that offering. That's right. That's right, because the Jewish law was so complex that you almost had to be, as they would call them, lawyers, scribes, to be able to keep it all straight. Uh, Is our law, is our new covenant complex? It's about as simple as it gets. That's why... And, and you may not like this statement, but that's why in the New Testament you find very, very little 
rule or regulation for Christians other than love and treat people right and stay away from the world of Satan and, and so forth. But it didn't tell me, at 9 o'clock, can you do this? Or, or when you get in this, this church building, you do four things, and then, and then you take a little break and do the fifth one later. It doesn't talk like that. It's just, those kind of rules and regulations, according to the rule that Jesus came, don't work. They only serve to mess us up. So Jesus came, as the scripture says, to set us what? Set us free. He came to set us free of all that mess. Uh, and set us free from sin. So that we have the best that could ever be. We have the best that could ever be. And Satan will tug at you, even this week, to make you think it's not. But it is. Yeah, in, in fact, if you really boil it down, the scripture's pretty clear that Jesus even says that if, if you love like Jesus says to love, everything else kind of falls in place. Uh, in fact, Jesus would even say, even in that old law with all its complexity, if they could have boiled it down and understood that love God first and love your neighbor yourself, all those other things would be taken care of pretty well. But they couldn't get there. They, they didn't understand that. Jesus came, and that's, that's really what he told his, his 11 apostles. He said, if, if you will love each other like I have loved you, then by this all men will what? They'll know that you are my followers. Uh, they're not going to know it by how I dress. They're not going to know it by what I do inside this building even. They'll never see, the people will never see what I do inside this building, likely. But they'll know it by our love. Pretty interesting thing. Jesus came to give us a, a, a different kind of system. Uh, so we'll stop with that.